கேட்க பிடிக்காது So, I'll do my best and try to do it. We are all children of Macaulay, unfortunately. So, it's unfortunate that I'm much more proficient in English than any other Indian language. I will try and reduce this deficiency in my public preparation over the coming years. This much I guarantee. Fortunately, in Hyderabad, I'm going to be a little bit more in Hyderabad. to our blessings i don't think it would have been possible to expect this kind of a crowd on such a topic for this platform even 5 years ago i think the history of tamil nadu has come a long way from the origins of 1917 significantly i've had the benefit of calling him as tamil nadu in tamarai that is anna marai oh, i'm so sorry I'm so sorry my audible now yes okay fine i said i've had the benefit and the luxury and the fortune of calling anna marai tamil nadu in tamarai <laughs> and there's a very good reason for this i think the stars have aligned for all the right reasons at a time when i think the demographic composition tilts in favor of the youth you have a fantastic option and a voice to present someone who is as comfortable in khaki as he is in well waist t-shirt and someone who is capable of strangling i would say the local media as well as the national media very few people can do that and he comes from the city that i have studied in coimbatore so i have a very special soft corner for annamalai so i hope that under his leadership there is of course the expectation that political hindutva will make its presence felt at the electoral level but i genuinely hope that there is a greater rise of societal consciousness i agree with tetris we entirely that politics has a very serious bearing in terms of pop culture in terms of the music in terms of education in terms of setting the narrative but before an issue reaches the political level it goes through a churn at the level of the society so clearly options like annamalai tetasvi and leaders across the country are the product of a societal yearning which has been brewing for several decades asking will we not find leaders who will finally ventilate the suppressed voice of the civilization now you have to realize that while it's easy for us to sit and take pot shots at politics and politicians it's practically a thankless life and especially if you happen to be someone with a conscience it's even more thankless because 24 by 7 you're constantly traveling and i've just i've i've been following tejasvi's journey both over the last few years and especially over the last few months absolutely hectic and i thought my schedule was crazy with all that for him to be able to capture the sarans of dharma and indian civilization of the bharatiya civilization the way he has done is not a reflection of his preparation is a reflection of his commitment and conviction in the strength of the civilization because preparation will take you only to a certain distance but beyond that do you truly believe in what you preach and practice or let's say do you truly believe in the words that are coming out of your mouth i think the audience is smart enough to understand that and i think the reaction of the audience clearly bears out the strength of his conviction i'm usually not in the 
I, I don't have the practice of basically saying he's my friend or she's my friend, but I can confidently say he and I have a very good equation, wherein at the very least, it's possible to reach out and express some real concerns. I genuinely hope Tejasvi remains accessible and approachable to people like us as he climbs the ladder, which he will. Now, coming to the topic, let me build on what Tejasvi has, uh, I think, laid a fantastic foundation for. Now, the sum and substance of what he has said is more about the innate civilizational unity of this land. The need to preserve that unity, especially for the next 25 years, because I genuinely believe, and I think we, are, we share that particular belief, that the next 25 years will be as interesting as they will be challenging. Because people who were expected to remain silent have suddenly started speaking up. And therefore, it is bound to make a lot of people uncomfortable. And it is time that this particular vocalization of a position translates to real outcomes. I'll give you a very clear example of this. I come from a city which wants everything from politicians but rarely takes part in politics when it matters, which is Delhi. It wants the best of everything. And the ones who come forward to take pot shots at infrastructure and everything under the sun didn't even bother to turn up for the elections, for the MCD elections. There was practically no representation from the so-called elite parts of Delhi. If you think politics is dirty, assuming for a moment that is truly the case, that dot still has an impact on your daily life. So you, you do not have the option of staying out of it under any circumstances. Is there a single program on Netflix which is any more apolitical? No, it's not. It is heavily political and ideological. Because you thought that OTT platforms were capable of at least giving you content which is free of the political nonsense that is spewed from mainstream pop culture. But that's not possible because an ideology which accused a community of hijacking politics has handed over politics to a family, not even to a community. <laughs> that's the irony of it. I could have still understood that in this power sharing cycle that goes on over, over centuries, that power moves from one community to another community, that is the nature of history. I, come, I can completely live with that. But it has finally come back to one particular family and it's not even as if the community for which it was voted for has benefited from it. Because I'm a realist, so therefore I'm happy to live with the reality that with each power cycle, one particular community benefits and then it moves on. Possible, because it's a question of power, it's a question of real estate, it's a question of numbers, it's a question of muscle on the street. All these factors can be taken into account. I have really no problems with that. Now, why is it that these topics become relevant? The one thing that Tejasvi said is very pertinent. I'm just trying to build on that, which is, how did we allow, uh, allow these fake narratives to find water and to find nourishment in this land? It goes back to a central thesis that I've, I've been trying to put out for the last three, four years. You can only blame the outsider to a significant extent, but beyond that, you have kept your doors open for the outsider. And therefore, it is a blame that we must equally share for the fissures that have been created amongst us. So while I will certainly focus and request the members of the audience to focus on the larger message of unity that he has presented, the way to that unity is to understand the root cause behind the existence of divides among us. Now it takes us to a slightly uncomfortable realm, but then I am no stranger to speaking uncomfortable truths. So I might as well do my best to make this session as uncomfortable as possible. <laughs> <laughs> the recent controversy surrounding Pondi and Selvan as to whether Cholas were Hindus or not, 
and whether Saiva Siddhanta is part of Hindu fabric or not, we can keep laughing at it because to us it says, what nonsense is this? But there was a very clear political theological foundation that was laid in this part of the country for this particular kind of politics to find support. Tejasvi mentions the period from 1915 to 1925. I would just request you to go back perhaps a century before because the origins of it effectively starts from 1801. So I'll give you just a few timelines. By the time I am done, I will connect the politics of 1801 to the Sabarimala petition of 2016. I will cover everything. What is the nexus between the roots that were laid in 1801 till what happens and what continues to happen in Sabarimala? So 1801, there is a gentleman by the name H.T. Colebrook who comes to this country as part of the gift of Europe, which is colonization. And he effectively says that all languages in this country are to be traceable to Sanskrit. That is the original position of the Christian missionary in this country. Now, which was the first part of Bharat that was effectively colonized? Bengal. So what are the major regions? You have the Bengal presidency, you have the China Madras presidency, then you have the Bombay presidency, and then you have Allahabad. That's how exactly these presidency courts were set up. So if you read the politics of Bengal and you read the politics of Madras, you will have a very clear picture of how the missionary movements moved. How is it that every reform movement with respect to Hinduism starts exactly in those places? where the British power center is established. And along with that, the missionary comes with him. So by 1801, their position broadly based on the oriental school of thought about Bharatiya philosophy that is set up by missionaries in Bengal is that Sanskrit is the mother of all languages. This is the original position. Subsequently, from around 1830s onwards, Robert Caldwell is a much later phenomenon. He features in the history of this land only around 1856 onwards when he wrote his seminal work, The Comparative Grammar of Dravidian Languages. And by 1881, his work was almost done because by then he had become the bishop of a particular region in this country or in this particular land. And you will perhaps have a very clear picture as to why does the demographic composition reflect a certain way. He became the bishop of Tirunal Veli. So don't be surprised at the demographic composition of that particular part of the country because the investment is not 100 years old. The investment is close to 200 years old in that particular region. So you're not fighting DMK. You're not fighting DK. You're not fighting Justice Party. You're fighting the investment which was much prior to the Justice Party, which was older to the Justice Party by at least a century. At the very least. So prior to him, there were two administrators, Francis Ellis White and another gentleman, Campbell, Alexander Campbell who come to this part of the country because you see India was first of all a punishment posting for people in the civil services in England because this is a hot country, dirty country, heathens, pagans, idol worshippers, black people. And the punishment posting like Madras on the Adhikmala punishment posting because that was seen as Yadranath Sani. Sade Sati, literally. Tropic of cancer out of blast furnace lam chuttanga. Inga poya vanda vandu vegar dhan solli. And therefore, since Bengal presidency happens to be the first brush of the British colonizer with the Indian civilization, and since he is not used to the cultural diversity of this land, when he comes to Madras, 
he thinks that this is so radically different from Bengal. And therefore, he starts assuming, look at the difference in physical features, look at the difference in script, look at the difference in language. 100% these are people from a different race. That's how their understanding starts. Because Bengal is not what you see as Bengal today. Bengal presidency includes the better part of North India until it's, uh, it's partition in 1905. So they see a certain culture there and Madras presidency goes right from the bottom until Odisha. And they say all these features and the difference in features must be attributed to something very, very fundamental. And that is a difference in race. Now you have to realize that simultaneously, as they just pointed out, missionaries are trying to find out what is the best way to convert. Because that's their single point agenda. Now can we learn Sanskrit and somehow establish a similarity between Sanskrit and our languages? So that we can go after the top order of the society, namely the Brahmins, and then convert the rest of the society. Once Brahmins have been converted, they fail to convert. And the worst part is, they thought we can give them a certain incentive by make, making them a part of the administrative infrastructure, teaching them English and whatnot. Poor people, they didn't realize that these hires were better at English than them. <laughs> there are records which have been captured in a fantastic book that was published in 1969 by an American journalist by the name Eugene Urshik. EU, for people who wish to read, E-U-G-E-N-E. -E. Urshik is I-R-S-C-H-I-K. His birthplace was Kodai Kanal. And this fellow captures all the correspondence and the frustration of the British man saying, we thought we will teach them, they come to the establishment and they are teaching us. But, since they are so quick at learning, you know what, we will have to tolerate them. And then gradually we have to start telling them, your brains are attributable to the fact that you are somehow related to us, so that foundations are gradually laid in the form of a connection between the so-called upper classes of this country and the British man in the form of the Aryan invasion theory that is slowly pushed. Now you have to realize there are two or three parallel streams that are going on. There is the political stream, there is the religious stream, how they merge together and then how Congress contributes to this problem in 1937. I'll come to it much later. I won't take too much time. So, the by, I think, mid-1850s or 1840s, there are two competing schools of missionaries and they are divided. One school of missionary effectively says, sorry, there is a commonality in the entirety of Bharat's culture. The other effectively says, no, Telugu and Tamil don't have Sanskrit as their parents. And that's how they start putting it out. In the politics between two groups of missionaries, the second group ultimately wins. So it's not as if their, their ideas are the same. End goal is the same, but they differ on the means. The second group says, no, there is a very clear distinction. And they start putting out, first is the linguistic separation. And then one group starts speaking of the racial separation. The genius of Robert Caldwell was to put together the racial separation and the linguistic separation together to basically say, all of this is attributable to the fact that there is actually a religious divide. So he brings together the deadly mix of religion, race and language. And you know how they do that? They go back to the one book that they were trying to give to us for these justifications, the Bible. So there is a biblical, uh, uh, let's say, figure called Noah who apparently saved the world from the flood, so on and so forth. So Noah has four children, Japhet, Shem, Aram, and Ham. By that time, William Jones, who is credited for 
revival of Sanskrit in this country had already taken the position that Sanskrit was the language of three children of Noah, Ham, Japhet, and Aram. Right? Shem. So, the new theory that starts is Tamil and Dravidian languages are the language of Shem. And that Tamil apparently is closer to Old Arabic and Hebrew than to Sanskrit. Imagine this was pushed and this was taken very seriously. By 1856, Caldwell makes this a central document. By 1881, when he has become the Bishop of Tinalveli, what he starts doing is, let me start mapping those parts of the Madras Presidency where there is a lot of competition between communities and see where I can push this most successfully. The training ground and the experimental ground became Tirnalveli. And there he was able to push that entire theory successfully. Now, parallelly what happens is, since you have effectively made the Brahmin the evil creature, his subsistence on the basis of dana from the rest of the communities are taken away. That leaves the Brahmin community with only one option for Sortani. English katan inge dwala pani tole ella. Vera vali illa ena inge nu saapada varadilla. So they learn English and they join. This fellow treats them as an irritant who has to be employed. And the rest of them see oh so he's learnt English and he's gone up. And that sense of competition is then exploited for the next hundred years. To effectively say, why should this community alone get English access? Why not others? Now then comes the next actor into this entire picture. There starts a fight between the Tamil identity and the Telugu identity. And the demand for a separate Andhra province also starts. So all of us will be fighting. You fight for Telugu, I will fight for Tamil. You fight for Modaliyar, he will fight for Ayur, this fellow will fight for Chettiyar. All of this will go on. The money seems to be coming from some other place. <laughs> swaha, 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 swaha. And somebody is pouring ghee into this fire. All of this goes on until a point where by early 1900s, the language divide, the racial divide, and the religious divide have acquired very serious political overtones. When a societal cord, let's say a societal fissure, becomes so serious for it to find political representation, that means it has achieved mainstreaming. It has become that serious because people are now talking about it at the political discourse. So, in the language of 1900s to 1920s, you will see the Aryan Dravidian divide. You will see the North Indian South Indian divide. You will see the Brahmin non Brahmin divide. You will see the Telugu Andhra divide. All of this playing into the hands of somebody else. And it moves to a point where in 1919, where the Muslims were asking for entrenchment of communal electorates, which is to say separate electoral reservations for Muslims, people from the South were effectively saying, We too want this for a certain set of communities altogether. When that gets rejected, representatives from this part of the country go to London to say, do not give India home rule. And these are representatives of the Justice Party who go to London and specifically plead. Home rule movement is apparently a Brahminical movement because it is led by Annie Besant. Because Annie Besant is one of the founders of the Theosophical Society of India, Vadayar. And she speaks of the greatness of this culture. And when she speaks of the greatness of this culture, she's talking about Brahminical culture. So if the British man leaves, the Brahmin will take over. Order. Active representations are made. So did you stop at communal electorates for a particular group of people? No, you didn't stop at that. It came to a point where you are actually looking at crystallization of a real concept called Dravidasthan. Because by then the point that is being made is 
as long as we are part of bharat tamil nadu in this particular part of this country will always receive secondary treatment because that victimhood was fed into our minds by the british administrator who didn't want to come here because he thought this was the worst of punishment posting and that was fed further by the missionary and finally a resolution is passed in kanchipuram in 1940 at justice party asking for a separate dravidasthan now they thought they would get a brilliant partner in this with mohammad ali jinnah because he was asking for pakistan so members of dravidasthan and members of pakistan were hand in hand is the situation any different today find out <laughs> now jinnah is not interested in these people he is like my people my people i don't care for you as long as i can divide and get my people and i, I can use you to get a separate country for my people you are useful when congress said we are not sitting on the table for any kind of negotiations if dravidasthan is on the table jinnah said i am not supporting dravidasthan anymore mudinjadu kada adoda avarku idu varaku unda so adoda avaru value mudichtaru then what will these anadays do they have no other option but to continue crying no no dravidasthan dravidasthan we have to do something about it so from 1940 until 1963 effectively when let's say from justice party it is moved to dk from dk it moves to dmk and then there is a clear parting of ways in terms of societal initiatives by our dadi periyar and by uh, anadurai on the other hand this movement continues now all this while they drop two or three goals of the so called dravidian movement the christian missionary is constantly saying break the caste structure it's easy to convert but a dravidian movement which is entirely based on caste identity cannot give up caste identity no they can only remove it from road names beyond that they can't do anything because without that identity how do we ask for 69% reservation for tamil nadu very difficult right over and above the constitutional ceiling of 50% that is a symbol of dravidian exceptionalism and entitlement where it believes that the rule that applies to the rest of the country does not apply to this country so they effectively start in terms of language imposition so on and so forth but the one mistake and this mistake has to be attributed to the congress party around that period on 1937 is when there is already an aryan dravidian divide there is already a language divide they introduce hindi in schools as a way of education there can't be a stupider move in the history of this country where you introduce hindi at a time when that language itself is the subject of a serious problem when there is already a huge divide offering it as an option is one thing but to treat that as a medium of education at a time when there is already a fire raging here which is being fueled by outsiders what kind of chanakya niti this was i have no idea and this was done by a particular politician who is apparently seen as the chanakya of his time and who was the sambandhi of gandhi adikmala na solla virumbala okay adikmala na solla virumbala i respect him a lot but this was the case okay governor general chief minister and all that later because when you are looking at history we have to be slightly more ruthless in and objective in our analysis our personal likings can go for a hike for a moment because you're talking about the country at the end of the day you're talking about the civilization so this is what happened now the next time and the next wave is that they realize that if we actively push for conversions the let's say the entire trick book will be open in front of the public so let's secularize it and we will secularize it in the name of anti brahmanism followed by secular rationality so on and so forth will be actively pushed because i have to protect my caste arithmetic in order for me to come to power so th- this goes on then in 1969 a young christian convert lays the foundation for the myth that continues on whatsapp till date he writes an article about how tirukkural was a christian and how he rather tiruvallur was a christian and how he was converted 
1969, this was written by a guy called Devanayagam. So he starts the textual evidence. Parallelly, the Bishop of Mylapur starts looking for archaeological evidence. So he pays someone to manufacture and create archaeological evidence. That apparently St. Thomas visited Bharat in 57 CE and that myth is given a, a certain degree of support. By 1975, as part of these efforts, one bishop pulls out a stone from a place called Nilakkal, which is supposed to be the playground of Swami Ayyappa in Sabarimala. And he says, this is the cross that was planted by St. Thomas at Sabarimala. This is 1975. Sabarimala Ayyappa devotees said, Nothing doing. We'll come up in black shirts. I'm the karup satik in the karup satik of Alapanna. DK or a karup ke, ayapan or a karup tam badil. I say this because that is one temple where all so-called caste differences merge and die. You don't know how to respect a woman, here's a brahmachari. You don't know how to talk about women, here's a brahmachari. Who knows what is celibacy, who has control over his tongue when he speaks about women or he, who, when he's in their presence. That's the difference. So 1975, this happens. Before that, in 1950s, the Sabarimala temple is broken into and the murti is hacked into pieces. Now, who has the incentive? I will not answer that question. And the temple is set on fire because you see, this is a Mala temple. And apart from that, since he is a yogi who is in, who is a Naishtika Brahmachari, it is not a temple that is supposed to be kept open year round. And therefore, what happens is the guardians of the temple, so on and so forth, they also leave the temple and they come down from the hill. So, burn the place and hack the murti into pieces. So, what started in 1950s, then there is an attempt in 1975. Read a few newspapers to what happened around the latest round of Sabarimala agitation in terms of the controversy surrounding Nilakkal again, where cross plantation started once more in Nilakkal. This is not new. This is the commitment where one failure doesn't result in silence. It results only in temporary silence. And then they wait for the right opportunity because all this while simultaneously, the Hindu society is being constantly de thanks to its education in English. So you will wait when the society itself is ready to spew and spit on its own culture and then you reclaim the place. The latest round with respect to Sabarimala, I don't know how many people have been reading this, is if the male Shanti of Sabarimala can come only from a set of families. That's the latest question. And the weapon that will be wielded once more, whose value and whose consequences I will leave it to the audience to judge, is the weapon called equality. Now, this is the broad setup or the broad framework of the Dravidianist cancer. Please address these problems immediately. It is no more in the realm of just pop culture. It is going to affect you in every way possible. The one part of this great nation or this great civilization that has managed to preserve its temples despite the ravages of time and history and 1200 years of barbarism is under a different kind of insidious attack. It is for us to say, okay, we'll keep fighting amongst ourselves. Our differences will continue, but no outsider will at least get the right to speak on the table when we are speaking. The ideal goal would be to somehow find a way to submerge these differences, but that's a long-term process. But at the very least, in the interest of survival, 
do not let an outsider partake in these discussions politically socially culturally they have no business talking to us or about us on these issues that is the one thing that i hope we go back with in the form of a sankalpam that's all i have to say namaste vande matram jai hind Thank you so much, Sri Sai Deepak, for this wonderful awakening speech that you gave us here on the topic Dravidi and exceptionalism and secessionist regionalism. It was actually a time travel. You took us across the history of two hundred years. You helped us demystify the idea of the missionaries, the idea that has been planned. and well executed over the last 200 years and how we have been divided in terms of the region north and the south the languages and aryan and dravidian and what not and also helping us demystify this noah's four sons and help us connect how they try to connect hebrew and arabic to one of the oldest languages tamil they have been fueling this fire and you also led us through the walk of the dravidastan and the pakistan and how devanayakam plotted this missionary fuel and carried on it on until today i hope all of us will carry these values and also remember the final point that you told us that we will not let an outsider speak while we are on the tires while we are on the table talking on the subject thank you ladies and gentlemen for being patient